Hi everybody, my name is Jens Larsen. In this video I'm going to take a look at some phrases from a Kurt Rosenwinkel solo. I'm of course going to talk about what he's using when he's improvising in terms of scales and arpeggios, but I'm also going to go a little bit deeper and try to explain a little bit what I think really makes the solo work and how the lines work in themselves and also the combination of the different types of lines that he's using in this solo. So some of the things I'm going to talk about are going to be the arpeggios and the quartal arpeggios and the patterns that he's using, how he's using chromatic runs, uh, how he's using side slipping within eight note lines because that's something he, got, he does quite a lot. Uh, there's also some stuff on playing across the bar line and extending the harmony and that way being quite free on top of the song. And finally, two things that are really important to how he works and how his solo sound great to me is that he has some lines that have really a large range, so going from really low on the guitar to really the high register within a short amount of time, and also how he mixes up different types of eighth note lines, really bop-oriented material with more motif and chord response type melodies. If you want to learn more about jazz guitar, improve the way that you solo, check out some interesting chord voicings or arpeggios, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to make sure not to miss anything, then click the little bell notification icon next to the subscribe button. The first example here is at the end of the first chorus of the solo and it's coming in right before the final cadence, so it's coming in the E7 before the final cadence, which is of course A minor 7, D7 to G major 7. It's an example of a long eighth note line. He's not staying in the same register and he's not using the same types of melody uh, within the line and I think that's also a bit what makes this work and what keeps the line interesting to listen to. So we come in on the E7 with a pickup, so, and then on the E7 it's really just one long chromatic run, so he starts up on the high D. Then we go to the A minor 7, and the A minor 7 is just a fairly straight ahead bebop line. Uh, he plays on the A minor uh, the, the triad from the third, so the C major triad, with a leading note up to the fifth of that triad, so up to the G. And this is, it's a fairly simple line. Actually, that triad and that leading note is something that he uses quite a lot. That happens, I think, three or four times within the solo. So then we get the D7. So the D7 here, he's using harmonic minor. He uses harmonic minor on dominance really often. Uh, and especially in this solo, you will see it quite a few times. The line here is a little bit less straight ahead bebop because he's not really using sort of the the way of bebop of moving from one chord to the next and always having a very clear direction uh, because he's skipping around a lot. So we first get one note, uh, one melodic idea that I would kind of define as a, as a pedal point idea. So we have the C as a pedal note point and then the E flat as a pedal point. And he actually stays on the D7 into the G bar, so and then resolves to the G on the 3. So the D7 line is one and a half bars long and sort of consisting of two pedal point ideas. And then on the G it's just a power chord. And then here we also have, because he's already moving uh, the bar line for the D7, so he's playing the D7 into the G major and he's actually keeping uh, his form, or the form that he's soloing on in that place. So after he plays the G, he plays an E7, he does that with a diminished arpeggio. Then A half diminished using a C minor triad. And then now we're actually in the next chorus, but he's still playing uh, the D7. And he's doing that either thinking A flat 7 or D7 altered. And then he plays a C diminished triad leading note and then resolving on B3 to the fifth of G, which is a D and then down to the root. This example is quite different from the previous one because even though this is still one long eighth note line and it's also several bars long, it's like uh, four or five bars long, then it is clearly motivic. It's not just a bebop line and he is sort of clearly 
taking a, an initial statement and then developing it and then turning it into a new motif and molding it and using some side slipping. So there's a lot of stuff happening within these four bars. This is on the G minor chord. It's a few bars later than the first one. So it's four bars of G minor and then he transitions into A minor. The first initial motif that he's working with here is just a combination of three different arpeggios. A D minor triad and then a G minor seven arpeggio and then an A minor triad. That's the original statement. Then he takes the, the last part of that and turns that into a new motif. So he makes a variation on that, which is just using the G minor and the A minor. Then he repeats that. And now he uses just the A minor as a motif and starts to move that up chromatically. So A minor to B flat minor, and then beginning of what could be a B minor. And then he goes to the to the A minor 7 in the next bar, which is essentially back to the A minor triad. I think this example really illustrates what blew my mind about Kurt Rosenwinkel's playing when I started listening to him. I didn't start listening to him with this recording, but really the two things that I was really impressed by with him in the beginning are both present really at the beginning of this example, because first we have line with a really large range within a very short amount of time, because he starts down here and then he plays this, which is essentially, it's just a G minor triad. But it's really going from this G to up to this D. And then the next thing that happens is that he has a sustained melody note here and then he adds chord on, chords under it. So we get an A minor 7 played with a C major triad, turning it into a D7. And those two things with adding harmony to your uh, solo lines and really filling stuff up with chords and also this idea of using lines that have a really large range which makes them really dramatic was something that I thought was really impressive and that I didn't really hear a lot in the people that I was listening to before. The way he continues here is he goes to D7 and he's playing a line that's quite similar to what he was doing on the E7 in the first example, so it's mostly chromaticism. Then on the B half diminished, he's actually reharmonizing this, so he's not playing a B half diminished, he's playing an F7, so the tritone substitution uh, to. So instead of playing B half diminished to E7, he plays F7 to E7, and he does that with with a fairly straight ahead sort of C minor line on the F7. Then on the E7, first a B half diminished arpeggio. And then just pretty clearly going to E7. And then going to A minor 7. Again, we have on the E7 that he's using not also scale, but really a harmonic minor as a scale choice. And then on a minor 7, here on the A minor 7 is just first, uh, well, he starts on the E7 and then it's really just an A minor 9 arpeggio. Then we get some side slipping. The top part of this is, of course, an E minor triad. And he moves that up a half step to an F minor triad. Then down again. And then this is still, I think, A minor, but now we're on B2 in the D7. And here he starts playing. Uh, D7 again. I would say this is harmonic minor. You could also argue that it's uh, well altered scale with leading notes, but I think essentially it's it's uh, harmonic minor. So we get this phrase, and then he's skipping up. Notice that he's not resolving this phrase on the D7 in the predictable way, because the predictable way of doing this would be that he would. end the phrase here, but he actually skips up to the A. And that keeps the melody moving. So in that way, the, the resolution is not as strong, but it does also, also keeps the things moving. And he actually keeps the line moving also for another two bars. So first we get a scale run on the G major. And then he's adding what I would say is a D7, also again from the harmonic minor scale sound. then this is taking us into the next chorus, hitting the, and here we get the resolution really, so up to the third, down to the fifth, 
And that's the end of the phrase. The reason that I can keep on publishing videos every week is that there is a community of people over on Patreon that are supporting the channel. I'm very grateful for their support and it's because of them that I can keep on making all these jazz guitar and music theory videos. If you want to help me keep making videos then check out my Patreon page and if you join us over on Patreon I can also give you something in return for your support. I've talked about before how I think Kurt Rosenwinkel is using some of his technical exercises to create melodies and I think this is an example of one of those. So what we have here is a line that's uh, in the bridge and he's, he's kind of adding a G7 that's not necessarily there in the harmony but what he does here is on the B flat major 7 and then there's a G7 that should take us to C minor and he just plays this movement that is starting on the B flat and it's pretty much a scale movement and then he continues moving up uh, through a G7 line when he when he gets to the G7 in the next bar and that's this line. So really creating sort of a continuous movement in one direction that just sort of changes color along the way with the changes and that's something that's quite typical for him and also something that you don't hear that many people do actually. I think Mark Turner does this as well and it's likely that he also got it there or at least that's something that they share in their style. Having this idea of a melodic movement that moves through the changes and then just uh, sort of mutates to fit the changes along the way. In one of the previous examples, Rosenwinkel was using motifs and really developing that motif within an 8-note line. And in this example, he is also using a motif. It's developed a little bit more in a technical way because he's really just making it into a sequence that he's moving partly up through the scale and then up through the changes. So in this example, it's right after the bridge. It's first on the G major 7, then moving on to G minor. And he sticks with that same idea, which is a quartal arpeggio. The first part is just a G major triad. And then we get the chordal arpeggio, so first from A, then just moving that up and further and just keep on going, moving to G minor, going up to, and then he's actually skipping up to this one and then he plays a developed version of the chordal arpeggio because now he plays the chordal arpeggio in two octaves, so, and then moves that down a whole step. and then uses that as well. Same idea, so here we're just turning sort of this same chordal arpeggio into a two octave version. And then he's first playing that descending from this one and then ascending a whole step lower. And then back to the first one, ending on the third of the G minor. And what you have here is really that the chordal arpeggios start to sort of become a little bit independent of what is happening under them because the first part is really just following the, the G major and maybe it becomes a D Lydian sound uh, and actually sometimes at this point in the form he will play two bars of G major and then he'll change the, the harmony to an A with a C sharp in the bass and then sort of an A minor with a C in the bass so you get this melody so that happens quite a few times he doesn't really do that here but that would fit with the harmony of the chordal arpeggios as well uh, and on the G minor he's kind of going away from the G minor sound once he starts moving down here where we get something that's actually more of a C minor on top of the G minor and that's really just focusing I think on the chordal sound and letting that be its own thing. He does change the harmony for these sort of long four bar periods of one chord a few times through the solo. There's another place where he takes a G minor chord and starts, he starts on the G minor with just a really basic G minor line. And then he kind of adds A7, D7 by playing two diminished arpeggios. And then going back to G minor on the one. So that's also something that works, that he works with, that he's changing the harmony while he's playing.
If you want to check out how Kurt Rosenwinkel is improvising when he's working with a Wayne Shorter tune, so a much more modern type of harmony than this jazz standard, then check out this video where I'm analyzing his solo on Nefertiti. If this is the first time you see one of my videos and you want to learn more about jazz guitar, then subscribe to my channel. If you want to help me keep making videos, then check out my Patreon page. That's about it for this time. Thank you for watching and until next time.